going to come and introduce the family, and so they're going to sing a special right off, and good to have everyone here this morning, Mark. Well, good morning to all of you. Thank you so much for being here on this Lord's Day. Thank you, Pastor, for the privilege of coming. And Pastor didn't know when he invited me to come that I was bringing the, uh, quite a bit of our family. And actually, at the time that we scheduled this, I was not aware who all was going to be here either. Sometimes I don't, uh, I don't know the entire plan, okay, and, until they all arrive. And I'm so thankful that uh, not only is my twin brother and his family here, but my mom and dad are here. And we had a special day yesterday. Yesterday was my mom's 70th birthday. And uh, she is my mom and she's known as Nana. And so we had a big celebration yesterday at, at our house. Had a great day. Uh, just uh, thanking the Lord for what God has done in our family. And my mom is a huge, huge part of that. She has influenced her three sons in a great way. All of us are serving the Lord in ministry. And of course, she prays for us every day and has supported us all the way through. And I'm so thankful for her. But she's also an incredible grandmother uh, to our grandchildren. And we have quite a few of them here today. I think we're only missing four uh, out of all of the grandkids. And uh, most of you know that my brother Matt is a missionary in Hong Kong. And so uh, he is not here um, we FaceTimed or mom FaceTimed with them yesterday and maybe some of the others did as well. But he has two children there with him and he also has two children that are now married. One of them lives in Kansas and one of them lives in Kentucky. And uh, so they're the ones that are not here. But I'm going to have everybody come to the platform and then what I'll do is I'll just have, have my brother Mike, who is my twin brother, and uh, one of your uh, members has been calling me Mike all morning. <laughs> Remind me your name, brother. David. David, David um, I think he has a connection because maybe of Southland. Uh, uh, his daughter worked at Southland. And so he already started calling me Mike. He even uh, called me Matt one time already this morning. <laughs> and that's okay because I, I respond to all of those names. But my name is Mark. Okay, so now the way you remember this is that Mike wears glasses. Glasses go over your eye. There is not an eye in Mark. <laughs> David, did you, did you get that? All right, did you hear that this morning? Okay, so now he can, he, he can get it straight. And so Mike is my twin brother, and I'm five minutes older than him, but both of us married girls named Amy. Go figure, all right? It's kind of crazy. So I'm going to let Mike introduce his family and, and then I'll introduce my family, and then we want to sing together. My wife Amy's over at the piano. We've been married for 25 years, and the Lord's allowing us to serve at Southland Christian Ministries in Ringgold, Louisiana. And we have three, uh, three kids that are in the college up here at Maranatha. And uh, I'll start with my oldest. His name is Micah over there on the end. He's a senior at Maranatha. And then this is Malachi, and he's also a senior. I don't know how that worked, but one's going to graduate in <laughs> December, and one's going to graduate in May, Lord willing. And, uh, and then we have my daughter, Michaela, who's a, a junior at Maranatha. And then my youngest, McKenna, who's a senior in high school. And uh, so um, she'll be graduating this These next two. year. And so we're glad to be with you today, and uh, also thankful to be able to celebrate my mom's uh, birthday yesterday as well. And so my name is Mark and my wife is Amy and she's right here and we serve over at Maranatha Baptist University. I'm so thankful for the privilege of serving the students there and uh, a number of them are even here this morning. Good to see some of our students and our, some of our graduates as well. So thankful for them and God has given us four daughters. My oldest daughter is Megan. She's right here. She's a nursing uh, student at Maranatha and then Madison and she's in elementary education and so thankful that both of them are at, students at the university and then we have Morgan Morgan's right here she's 11 years old and then we have Meredith and Meredith is 10 years old now you notice that all the kids start with the letter M and uh, I think some of that was planned and some of it was unintentional okay we, we do like these names we actually do like all these M names but if you say them really fast, it's like a tongue twister, okay? Don't try it. And I, I wouldn't expect you to remember, uh, remember all of the names. Um, now, we have one up here who is from Hong Kong, okay? Her parents are in Hong Kong. And so that's Matt and Tiffany, who 
are serving there as missionaries, and their daughter, Abby, is here. This is Abby, and she's a student at Maranatha as well. And so I'm so thankful that uh, God has led her to be uh, not only at Maranatha, but be able to hang out with us quite a bit. I'm so thankful for that. And then, uh, of course, my mom and dad are down here, Carl and Debbie Herbster. And I'm so thankful for what God is doing in our family and how he's raising up the, this next generation to serve the Lord. So throughout this day, we're going to be doing a lot of music. Uh, Pastor has asked me to be speaking on the subject of worship and music. And so um, we're going to try to cover as much as we can in, in that regard in three services today. There's no way we can cover all of it, okay? I promise you there's a lot more to talk about, but maybe this will just kind of whet your appetite on, on worship and music specifically and why we do what we do in the area of music. And so I'll be speaking on that here this morning and in each of the services, but how appropriate it is that not only will we hear about worship and hear about music, but that God has allowed us to have our, our family here to be able to, I hope in some way, demonstrate what we believe is Christ honoring music that is done in a way that honors the Lord and is appropriate for his character. And so we'll be doing a lot of music today. I hope it's an encouragement to you. We also have CDs available out there in the lobby and uh, pretty much all of, of the people you see on the platform are on these CDs. Um, in, in some case, uh, the entire family is singing. We have one of those CDs called Resting where the entire family is there singing. I think that minus Morgan and Meredith, they were pretty young when we recorded that. But uh, the entire family singing on the, the CD called Resting. And then we have our newest uh, evangelistic team recording that we did just before we came to Maranatha. And this is called Total Devotion. And then we also have the brand new CD from Maranatha back there. This is an outstanding choir CD. If you do, do not have this yet, this is the, the newest recording from Maranatha Baptist University. We are selling those CDs throughout the day. We would love to help you get some good music in your home so you can worship the Lord. Uh, one CD for $15, three CDs for $40. If you want to buy five CDs, because there's probably about 14 different CDs back there, you want to buy five CDs, five for $65, okay? So if, you, if we can help you get some good music, take some of this music with you, we would love to do that sometime throughout this day. So we want to sing a couple songs before I speak here this morning. This first song, I hope, will be an encouragement and a blessing to you. Lots of people are fearful right now. There's a lot going on in our world. There's a lot going on politically, militarily, and of course with the pandemic. And there are people that are incredibly fearful. But when you know your God and you trust in your God, there is, there is no reason to be afraid. And so we can trust in him. This is a powerful song. I shall not be afraid. The Lord is my light and my savior, my strength, my protector and guide. I run to his arms when in danger safe in his shadow I hide. Whom shall I fear when God is with me? Whom shall I fear? He shields me with love. His presence surrounds me completely. I shall not be afraid. When all of earth's comforts are lacking, my Lord in his mercy sustains. When all those I trusted forsake me, my God in compassion remains. Whom shall I fear when God stands with me? Whom shall I fear? He shields me with love. His presence surrounds me completely. I shall not be afraid. surrounds me completely I shall not be afraid I shall not be afraid Amen. 
Well, it's really a special joy for me to have my brother Mike here with me. And uh, we traveled together for 13 years in full-time evangelistic ministry with our families. This is actually the first place we met your pastor, and it was out in good old Cheyenne, Wyoming. And I'm so thankful for the ministry that your pastor has had, not only here, but for many years there in Wyoming. Uh, we, we had the privilege of serving with him on several occasions. And so it's, it's actually kind of a rare thing now for me to actually be able to sing with just Mike, because we used to do that for so many years. And uh, so I inserted a couple songs today. Maybe, that, maybe it's for me. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, you guys won't enjoy it as much as we do. And uh, we've been singing a lot of duets together, and of course we're twins, and so there's, there's a really tight DNA connection there, okay? So the voices should blend fairly well, but uh, so thankful for Mike and his ministry down at Southland Christian Ministries in Ringgold, Louisiana. God is using he and his family in a powerful way. We want to sing a song that we've sung a number of times together. It's a, it's a new arrangement of the great hymn text, And Can It Be? It's called Amazing Love. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued? Amazing love, how can it be? That thou, my God, shouldst die for me. Amazing love, how can it be? That thou, my God, shouldst die for me. He left his father. He left his father's throne of father's throne of love. So free, so infinite, so free, so infinite is grace. Humbled himself, humbled himself and came in love. And came in love. And bled for Adam's child's blessed race. Amazing love, how can it be? That thou, my God, shouldst die for me. Amazing love, amazing love, how can it be? How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? No condemnation now I dread. I am my Lord's and he is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, that thou, my God, God, that thou, my God, should die for me. Amazing love, amazing love, amazing love, amazing love, amazing love. If you are thankful for God's love for you today, say amen. amen. I hope that you understand that is why we are here. That is why we are at God's house on this Lord's day. And uh, my brother Matt would be singing here with us if he were here today. And uh, we actually have the Herbster Trio. We, we recorded a, a recording many years ago called Be Strong in the Lord. We actually still have that available if you want the, the first ever recording that we did. Um, I don't know how good it is, but I, I, you know, we sure had a lot of fun. Mr. Mac Lynch from the Wilds Christian Camp well, many years ago asked us to uh, be a part of that project. And we did our first two recordings through the Wilds uh, Christian Camp. And then we've been doing recordings through our ministry. 
And now uh, both of us are involved in, in other projects. Uh, of course, for me at Maranatha and Mike is operating a Southland Christian uh, music. Uh, what do you call that, Mike? Southland, uh, Southland Music Services. Southland Music Services, which is still getting music available to a lot of, of wonderful, a lot of people around the country. Lots of great recordings available through there. And we believe that music is important. We believe that worship to God is important. Uh, take your Bibles this morning and turn to John chapter 4. I'm going to step back a little bit because uh, the HDMI cord is, uh, is too short to reach to the uh, platform. So uh, a lot of what I'll be teaching and, and showing this morning will be on the screen. And I hope that it can be a blessing to you as we jump right into a discussion about worship, music, and the local church. Do these, thing, do these three categories go together? They absolutely do. Now, I want to be very clear that worship is not, worship and music are not synonymous. They are not equal. Music is actually only a form or a way of worship. There are other ways that we worship. We worship when we give. We worship when we read the scripture. We worship, obviously, when we hear the Bible taught. And this is outlined for us in a great way in the book of Acts in the early church. There are certain things that are required to be in the worship of the local church. But as you and I know, throughout the New Testament and throughout church history, music has been and should be one of the primary ways that we as believers are seeking to worship the Lord. So what does it mean to worship? I hope everybody can see the screen. Feel free to move if you need to in order to see the screen. I know this is a big pulpit. If you need to move, uh, I, would, I would hate for you to miss uh, the, uh, the text that is on the screen. Feel free to do that if you need to. So let's talk a little bit as we jump into this about the idea of worship. The English word worship comes from this compound word worth Ship. It literally refers to the attitude and the acts of our reverence to God. There's a lot that could be said about just the definition of the word, but we've got a lot to cover here in just a few brief sessions uh, this morning. But the English word actually helps us to see what the intention is. And, and immediately we see through the definition of the word that worship is not about us, but it's about who? It's about God. And so even in the definition of the word, it is, it is God's create, uh, creative people, his, his, his people that he has made and really all of his creation, giving the reverence, giving the honor or literally giving the worth back to the Lord. The Hebrew word literally means to bow down in Psalm 95 verse six. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. And I think that is an appropriate posture, not only mentally and emotionally, but even physically. Often we will bow before the Lord. We bow before him as we submit ourselves to his word. And we bow before him as, as we sing praises to his name and we reverence him in that way. So the word means to bow down or to, or, or to give homage to uh, the king, to give homage to somebody who is the ruler. And that is the Hebrew word used throughout the Old Testament. There are several Greek words that are used, but the primary uh, meaning of the Greek word in the New Testament literally means to kiss toward, and, and, and uh, very similar to the Hebrew word, as we bow down and we honor the Lord and we, we give the reverence due his name. And, and uh, the word kiss also gives us the idea of affection or compassion or love toward him as well. Matthew 2, verse 2, the word is used. For we have seen his star in the east and we have come to worship, to kiss toward him, to show him the worth, to bow down before him. And so when we think about the idea of worship, uh, worship is the overall experience that we as believers uh, have in giving our worth and reverence and respect to a God who is greater than we are. So that's what worship is. We're going to be talking about worship quite a bit throughout this, ses this session this morning and the morning service as well. And, and of course, worship is at the very foundation of the Christian's music philosophy. If you're going to decide what you're going to do in the area of music, you have to know what worship is. Because it's really not a music issue, it's a worship issue. It's a worship issue. Is it? Is it music that is worthy of God? Is it music that really focuses us in, in bowing before the Lord? 
Uh, when I've done uh, the significant uh, study on the subject of worship, I've come across a number of wonderful, powerful quotes. I hope you can see these as I read them. Uh, William Temple, who was the former Archbishop Bishop of Canterbury, said this about worship. He said, to worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to feed the mind with the truth of God, to purge the imagination by the beauty of God, to open the heart to the love of God, to devote uh, the will to the purpose of God. And what's, what I want you to notice is that the complete person is mentioned in this quote. The complete person is the mind, the, the emotions, and the will. And I think you're going to see that in a number of these quotes that I show you from several different authors who have written on the subject of worship. James Montgomery Boyce, in his, uh, in his work on uh, music and worship, said this, if a person has a right opinion about God, the person can form a correct opinion about God's attributes and thus can praise or glorify God correctly. And so again, notice the connection between the way we praise God, which would be our music, the way we sing to the Lord and the connection to the character of God and the understanding of God is. This brings great weight to the reality that there's a lot of false worship because there's a lot of people that don't know God very well. False worship is an evidence of shallow Christianity. And so as we talk about this, I hope that God would even challenge you to have a deeper relationship with him because the more you know him and the more you understand him, the more you reverence him and the better quality of worship and music you will give to glorify his name. So this is from a very outstanding author and writer. And No, just kidding. This is the, this is the definition that I have come up with as I have studied uh, studied a lot about worship and read many, many wonderful books on the subject of worship. And there's a reason why I'm giving you this one before the next two. And I'll tell you about that in just a moment. So this is a definition that I have come up with. And, and there are a couple guys in here that have been in my worship class. This is where we start. We start with the definition of worship. And uh, I'm not giving you the entire class here today, by the way. Okay. Even though I do talk fast, I'm not talking that fast. Worship is responding intellectually, emotionally, and volitionally with awe, adoration, and affection to the truth of God, his word, and his salvation. Notice again, the, the complete person in several different categories, honoring God and, and responding to God is the key word, responding these ways to our great God. Now, it's always Wonderful when you develop a definition and then you find out there's smarter people who actually say it very in, in a very similar way. <laughs> That's always encouraging. Anybody ever experienced that before where you're like, I, I kind of categorize this this way. And then you're reading in some book and you're like, that guy's really smart. And wow, I got it right. I said it the same way he did. And I, I literally developed this this definition, not based upon uh, the quotes that I'm going to show you. But what I want to show you is that this is, this is what a number of people are saying. Uh, a, lot, a lot of people who have studied this issue more than me uh, are saying very similar words. Here's an older writer, Warren Wearsby. And many of you are familiar with a lot of his writings. He said, worship is the believer's what? Response. There's the key word. Worship is the believer's response of all that they are. Mind, emotions, will, and body to what God is and he says and he does. And then a more contemporary author who is actually still writing and still teaching today. This is actually the book that we use in our worship course at Maranatha. Uh, the, the book called Worship in Song. And this is Scott Annual. Dr. Scott Annual has a degree in music and a degree in theology and has studied this way more than I have. And he said, worship is the spiritual what? Response. Worship is the spiritual response to God as a result of understanding biblical truth about God. And, and so just to give you a little hint of to what we're going to talk about in the morning service, it's going to be more of a preaching session on the subject of responding to God. Because all of us need to realize responding to God does not just happen on Sunday. It happens in our life. It has to be a way of life. And maybe you've heard it said this way. Worship is a way of life. Worship is not to be compartmentalized to just the Lord's day. And, and especially not to just one form of worship, which is our music. 
But worship is the complete person responding to God. And the reason we sing is because singing is our response to God. Okay, so I hope you're following, you'll follow this throughout the day. So we've turned in our Bibles to John chapter 4, and, we, and we'll be in this passage for, for a little bit here this morning, and then we'll, we'll touch on it again in the beginning of our worship service and the message there as well. But in John chapter 4, we have the classic passage where Jesus himself is speaking on the subject of worship. And the primary application of John chapter 4 is that Jesus is the living water, and Jesus is literally the gospel incarnate. And, the, and so he's sharing the gospel with this woman, the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well. And in this conversation, she asks a specific question to Jesus about worship. Look at verse 19. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So we see this is clearly a worship text. It's, it's a direct question to Jesus Christ. And Jesus makes an incredible statement here, and I want to give you these three principles from these next several verses. Notice verse 21. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. That is an amazing statement. You know what that tells me? Principle number one from this text, and that is true worship to God is centered on a person not a place or a plan. All right, so the Samaritans worshiped at Mount Gerizim. The, the Jews worshiped at Jerusalem. And this is the same controversy that a lot of people have today because they might even ask you, where do you worship? And really the answer to that, if we're thinking about it, is everywhere. But the fact is we do have places like this church auditorium, this church facility where we worship. And isn't it true that not only just the Samaritan woman would struggle with compartmentalizing her worship to Mount Gerizim, but don't we struggle with this as well? And don't other churches and other denominations and, and typically people think that when you worship, you worship at the church. And sadly, we are tempted to be focused on the place and even the plan, or as some would say, the liturgy, the, the uh, structure of the service. Now, don't get me wrong. We'll probably talk maybe a little bit about this throughout the day. Structure and intention in worship is very, very good and very helpful because God is worthy of that. He wants us to have an orderly plan. But we shouldn't be focused on the plan. So much so that Typically in a Baptist church, if something is a little bit different than it was last Sunday, everybody's like, why did they change that? <laughs> well, you know, I actually think that it's appropriate and, and sometimes very helpful to rearrange the order of worship so that the focus is not just on the order. Well, you know, that's not what we do here. No, but the focus is on Jesus Christ. Okay, so you see this, this simple principle that we see here in John chapter 4 in, in verse 21. We, we too, have, we struggle through this sometimes and we say, now's our time to worship. No, worship is all about the Savior, Jesus Christ. And we need to make sure that we're focused on the person, not the place or the plan. Now, notice the next verse. As we just walk through this, verse 22 says this. Jesus said, you worship you know not what. That's an amazing statement. I wonder today, are there, are there any uh, people that will come to Greendale Baptist Church? They don't even know the God they claim to be worshiping. What we know is there are a lot of churches that are full of worshipers that don't even know God. He says, you worship, you know not what. Then he says, we know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. That phrase there simply means that salvation comes through Jesus and the Jewish people. Okay? Not through Judaism. We know we're not saved by works. We're saved by Jesus. Jesus is a Jew. Jesus uh, came through the nation of Israel. So what is the principle that we see from this verse? I think it is simple. True worship is clarified by insight, not intention or impression. Now let me explain a little bit. Just because someone intends to be worshiping doesn't mean they're worshiping. The fact is, 
if you are dishonoring God and his character and his attributes, it doesn't matter what your intentions were. You can have a lot of good intentioned people engaged in false worship. So, and the reason why there's sometimes there's good intentions, but th there's no true worship is because there's a lack of knowledge. The insight uh, and the knowledge of God is what brings great clarity to our worship. And this is really important because you'll talk to people about their music and they'll say, well, my music, this music makes me worship. That does not necessarily mean it's true worship. Uh, we, can, we can have people who are confused about their intentions or impressions of what's happening. And actually, we know that our emotions and our feelings are like roller coasters. Our feelings have to be uh, engaged with the truth of the Bible and clarified by the insight of the truth of God and his word. And so this is a very important uh, lesson for us. I think what we see going on in the Christian community is a lot of, uh, of serious people. They love God. They, they, they want to please God. And they actually believe they have good intentions. And they, but they still could be engaging in false worship. Now, to me, one of the classic examples of this is uh, the children of Israel with the golden calf. You, do you realize if you study that text carefully, they actually had intentions of worshiping Jehovah through the golden calf, through worshiping or through building the golden calf. I think all of us would agree that was false worship. Amen. They should have known the obvious command of God to make no graven image. They had good intentions. I believe that they were intending to worship Jehovah through the golden calf. But what what happened? They were judged. They were judged, and, and actually it's interesting if you do a study on false worship in the Old Testament, God did not look too kindly on that. There are a lot, if I can say it this way, there's, there are a lot of dead people because of false worship, okay? And if we choose as believers to worship God and the right God, but we worship Him in the wrong way, we're still out of bounds. So we need, to be, we need to have our worship clarified by the excellence and the beauty and the majesty and the power and the holiness of God. And once again, it goes to the depth of our relationship with God. So true worship is clarified by insight, not intention or impression. I think that's clear in verse 22. Now, notice verse 23. We have two statements here. Uh, where Jesus repeats himself and he says this, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in what? Spirit and in truth. Notice verse 24. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. This brings to me the third principle I think we see, the general principle we see about worship from John chapter 4. And that is true worship is characterized by reality and honesty, spirit and in truth, not by ritual and hypocrisy, spirit and in truth. All right, so what does it mean to worship God in spirit? Well, I heard one person say it this way. God is a spirit. We worship him in our spirit and we worship him through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's a simple way of saying how we worship God in spirit. In other words, it's not primarily our physical activities. It's primarily our heart. It's what's going on in our heart where we are acknowledging mentally that God is a spirit and we don't see him physically, but we know about him by the eye of faith. We know that he's holy. We know that he's powerful. We know that he's uh, majestic and beautiful. And we should know that very, very well as we see him in his word. And so in our hearts, there's this movement. There's this intellectual and emotional and then physical response of bowing before the Lord. And, and, we're, and we're honoring him in our soul, in our spirit, and this is why the emphasis should not primarily be on the physical activities that we're doing, and especially, I think, the entertainment mode that we have in American culture, where, where we show up to church and instead of being uh, participants, we're, uh, we're spectators. And this is what typically happens. We silently grade the performance and we look to see what is happening. Maybe even already this morning, that is, that is uh, your heart and you've already been doing a little bit of, of performance-driven evaluation. 
You know, I don't know if I like this guy. I don't know if I like that music. I'm not sure if, 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 if that was done all that well. And, and, and it is, isn't this the mindset of most American Christians? And they're looking for a performance. They're looking for a physical, entertaining, even service. When really it should be in our spirit. And, and there's something that touches our spirit. And that is the excellence and the beauty not only of God, but of God's creative people Amen. through incredible poetry that is put to a distinct music that we sing. They're called hymns, right? Amen. And they engage our minds. They touch our hearts. And maybe we're so performance driven that we're not even we're not even recognizing the depth of those lyrics, the depths of those songs that we're singing. And so it's in our spirit. So we worship him in spirit, reality, and honesty. And that's the truth. And how do we worship God in truth? Well, anything that we do that is inconsistent with the truth is out of bounds. It's false worship. Maybe I can say it this way. The, the example of Jesus and the exhortation of Scripture. Jesus is the living truth. He showed us the way. Anything we do... And I would say, especially in our public worship, I think in our personal worship too, but especially in our public worship, we should make sure that everything and anything we are doing represents Jesus and being more like Jesus Christ. That's what it should be like. That's worshiping him in, in truth. And then, of course, any Bible command or principle, we need to be obedient to those commands in every area of our worship. Now, just to kind of whet your appetite, maybe do a little more study on your own, there is, what it, there, there is what is called the regulatory principle in worship, which says that we would not insert into our, into our worship anything that is not directly commanded or exemplified in the early church. Uh, and so there, there, are, there, there are ways that we can actually go to the Bible and decide what should we be doing in our worship. And only those things we should be doing in our worship. It's what's called the regulatory principle, and that is that the scripture, the truth, regulates our worship. And it should. It should regulate our lives. Amen. And so these are some principles that we see from John chapter 4. Now, if you're staying with me, you notice that I didn't read one, one phrase of the text yet. And don't worry, we're, that's the phrase we're going to jump off of in the worship service, in, in the message from the worship service in just a moment. But let's continue and let's talk about, uh, let's talk about how these principles show up. And, and notice what James Montgomery Boyce, or I'm sorry, excuse me, William Barclay said about this idea. And really it kind of goes right along with these principles that I that just shared. He said, the true, the genuine worship is when man, through his spirit, attains to friendship and intimacy with God. True and genuine worship is not to come to a certain place. It's not about the place. It's about the person. It is not to go through a certain ritual. It's not about the plan. It's not about just going through the hypocrisy of church things or elements. He said it's not even to bring certain gifts. True worship, he says, is when the spirit, the immortal and invisible part of man, speaks and meets with God who is immortal and invisible. That's a wonderful quote. And then uh, as we just kind of wrap up this idea this morning, uh, one of my favorite quotes from a man named David Wells, who is actually a current contemporary writer who writes about philosophy and sociology in comparison to what is happening in the church. He has written a number of wonderful books. One is called God in the Wasteland. One is called No Place for Truth. Uh, one is called The Courage to be Protestant. And he is writing about the, how the culture is impacting the church. And I, I believe this is absolutely true. The fundamental problem in the evangelical world today is not inadequate techniques. If you show up to a church today, they have grand auditoriums. They have all kinds of technology. They have great techniques for how they're going to do their services. We don't need more techniques the, the problem is not in, inadequate techniques, insufficient organization, or antiquated music. Notice this, but the main problem, is, this is what he's saying, but the main problem is that God rests too inconsequentially on the hearts of the uh, people of the church. So God is not as important as he should be. 
His truth is too distant. His grace is too ordinary. His judgment is too benign. His gospel too easy. And his Christ is too common. Is he describing what's happening in the evangelical world? And folks, with with kindness and compassion in our hearts, we need to make sure that we understand what God is calling us to do and be in the area of worship. And I think this is there's application in, in three different layers. First of all, we all personally need to make sure we are worshiping God in spirit and in truth. We need to make sure that we are confident and that, our, that we're not violating our own conscience, that we're not doing things personally in our worship to God, whether that's through our music or, or other ways that we are living, that we are personally honoring and giving God the worth and bowing before him appropriately. Secondly, I believe application needs to be made in our homes because strong churches are made up of strong homes. And you know what? Kids are struggling with contemporary music, Kids are struggling with an entertainment lifestyle. Kids are struggling with all kinds of, uh, of, of things of our culture because there's a particular place that, where God has called us to be training the next generation, and it's called the home. Amen. And by the way, it, it, the, the greatest responsibility is for us as fathers. And you fathers, uh, provoke not your children to wrath, but what? Train them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And this is why... Uh, all of us should, as, as adults and as parents should be very well versed in the area of worship because guess what? We want to train our children how to worship. A little side note. This is why I like to have my kids sitting with me in church because you know how they learn to worship? They watch mom and dad. And they sing the hymns with mom and dad. I'm not opposed to children's ministries, but I, I, I think it's important that we do have our kids worshiping with us quite often. So that they can see that, wow, this is definitely different than the world. And they're starting to pick up from an early age. What does it mean to truly honor and worship the Lord? So there's the personal area, which affects our families, of course. But then there's the commitment to our families to train up the next generation. And then, of course, all of us are involved in a local church. And I'm thankful for your church. I'm thankful for Pastor. And I know that he has thought through a number of the things we're talking. He's thought through this. And I'm thankful for the stand and the philosophy that your church has. We don't just say we're conservative because we love old music. We don't just say we're traditional because we we are standing on tradition. No. But traditions are built over time based upon the truth of the Bible. We, We need to evaluate those traditions. Some of them can go. Others should definitely stay. But your church is a conservative, traditional church in its music. And I'm glad that I didn't drive up today and and see a sign that said traditional service this time, uh, contemporary service this time. To me, that shows that the church doesn't even know how to worship the Lord. they, they, They themselves, the church leaders, haven't even decided. What does that tell you? Maybe maybe there's some postmodern teaching going on. They can't even determine how they're supposed to worship God. And so they're giving the people what the people want. And there's all kinds of problems with that. And so you should be thankful that you have a church that is is drawing some lines. You may not perfectly agree with where the lines are drawn, but you should be thankful that they care about that. They care about worship. So as we continue to talk about this throughout the day, um, we're going to get to some more details specifically on the subject of music. But remember, music is just a fruit of the foundation of what we just shared. The reason we choose the music we, we choose is because we want to be focused on a person, not a place or a plan. We want to make sure we're clarifying the worship for Christians with strong, uh, theological, theologically, dif- different, uh, theologically distinct and different music from the world. And we want to make sure that we are doing it in spirit and in truth. And so there's a reason why we're choosing the music that we're choosing. So personally and in our families and in our local assemblies. Now, this is where we're going to have to stop here in Sunday school. But I hope as we continue to build this throughout the day, that it will seriously send you out personally to maybe do some of your own study. You know what? It is not strong enough in your music to just say, I like it. That's not good enough. There's a lot of stuff I like that doesn't please God. So 
our philosophy has to be a lot deeper than that. And, and I'm telling you, there's no way we can cover it all in these uh, few short services uh, on just this one day. But I hope that you will maybe even grab some of these books that I'm, I'm referencing and, and do your own research because it is of utmost importance that we are worshiping God appropriately because we're his people and he is a glorious, wonderful God. Well, we're going to conclude with a word of prayer and then we'll come back in our worship service and uh, we'll pick up, where, uh, pick up a little bit where we left off uh, also in the, in the afternoon service as well. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the privilege of being together this morning on this Lord's Day. And we truly do want to worship you appropriately. And we know that your word tells us it is possible to be a true worshiper, which means you can also be a false one. The, the Bible tells us we can worship you acceptably, which means there's a way that we can do it in an unacceptable way. And so we need to be uh, learning and, and growing in this area of worship and, and especially the music that we choose to use to represent you. Would you continue to teach us your way and help us to be open and uh, ready to receive it as we go to the worship service this morning? In Jesus' name, amen. Hope that's a help. God bless you. See you in just a moment, okay?